Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. All right, I have two special guests joining me on Postcards from a Dying World this time, and um, I've got editor, author, and publisher extraordinaire Eric Gignard, and um, uh, academic and writer Michael Arzen. Um, and you guys are the part of the team behind this amazing series of books. If you're watching the YouTube, I'm holding up all five of the Exploring Dark Short Fiction series, which is what we're gonna focus on today in this discussion. Although you guys do lots of other stuff. And at the end, we'll talk about the other stuff that you do. But we're gonna focus primarily right now on the Exploring Short Dark Fiction. So welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. It's great to have you guys here. Thank you so much for your time and for having us. Yeah, and I'm going to start with you, Eric. Um, how did you get into horror fiction in general? And because we kind of need to get both of your horror and dark fiction uh, origin stories. Sure. Oh, man, this is like, uh, I, I could, <laughs> I always feel like when I get asked this question, it turns into the most rambling, long winded explanation because I just love talking about it. So I'll try to keep it real, just precise, is that. As long you did as a I great can... job on This Is Horror, so people could always go and listen to that episode. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, that, that's an example of like a 20 minute, like, here's the story of my life. I was born in Los Angeles, but no, I, I feel like I've, I've always loved horror. Um, I know some people like it for different reasons. For me personally, I've always looked at horror as, as in a type of an adventure. Um, in me, traditional horror, you have a bad guy, he's the antagonist versus a good guy. Generally, at the end of horror stories, the, you know, in horror movies, the good guy wins. So they're actually very kind of uplifting tales. And so I've, I've always looked at it kind of, kind of along that way. And it just happens to be that's what I was drawn to my, my entire life for television, for comics, for books, for short stories. I just loved a lot of, I love old fashioned literature and the Gothic. And I just really enjoy kind of the, the emotional tales of classic good versus evil um and that's just kind of it just kept on throughout throughout my my entire life so I'll, I'll all right keep it uh, michael how did you get into uh horror and, and bizarro fiction and we don't have a this is horror episode to pull on for, for you <laughs> well i always tell people that first my dad sacrificed a goat on my <laughs> <laughs> uh i you know it, well i bet my dad i think i was really inf strongly influenced by my my father because he would bring me to the horror movies with him and this was in like the 1970s you know the age of the exorcist rosemary's baby all that stuff the, the golden horror of the 70s and like my mom wouldn't go with him so he would take me as a child and you know he'd just cover my eyes during the scary parts i guess the gore and the sex scenes and uh i think that turned me into a writer you know because i'd have to fill in the blanks uh, but i didn't actually start like writing until I was in the army after high school, I was just reading Stephen King novels like crazy when I was out in the field, you know, there, there's a lot of downtime. So I was just reading books like crazy. And I think I got to my like eighth Stephen King novel at where I said, oh, I bet I know what's going to happen in this one. And it was happening. And I was like, you know, I could do better than that. <laughs> and so I started trying and found out how hard writing really is. But uh, I just love it so much. I mean, reading, writing, it's the same thing for me. It's going into this headspace. And horror is like this dark headspace where it's a realm of discovery. It, you know, I, I, I always expect to be su surprised. Uh, I like to be, I like gross out jokes. Uh, I, I like, just, you know, to wonder about the supernatural. And, uh, and it's just the best. I mean, I've been doing this, you know, for at least 40 years, you know, so, since I was a kid. And uh, it sustains, you know. Uh, it's also the genre that's been around the longest, I think, you know, personally, I think the death has been a theme that's just been explored since the beginning of writing and storytelling. So uh, it's the good stuff. Right. Now, Eric, you, um, 
it's one thing to read, it's one thing to write, but to take on the role of editor and publisher and wanting to not just you know, read the stuff yourself, but make sure that other people are checking it out and reading it and finding the good stuff. That's something entirely different. How did you get into publishing and, and editing um, with Dark Moon Books, your, your, uh, your imprint? Um, I'm gonna say in general, I was looking at, for twofold, I was looking at ways, I didn't really start writing until I was 35. So I, I just kind of, I just kind of jumped into it. And I, I felt that that was a way to improve my writing was to look at it from the eyes of an editor. And when you start putting together anthologies, you start understanding the real reasons why um, stories are rejected. And then that's not anything personal, but there's a lot of background going to it that as a writer, you hear these things, but you don't really understand or empathize with them until you're actually put in that position. You start looking at things from the eyes of, of marketing and from PR. And the same way with now with, it, with publishing, you look at it from terms of from distribution and, and profit and loss. And then the, the second reason is personally, um, as much as I love horror, I love short stories more in general. And I've always just loved anthologies. To me, anthologies have been, that's been really the excitement of, of the reading realm for me my, my entire life is, is short stories. So as, as with many of us in life, we tend to imitate that which we are passionate about. And so short stories and anthologies, it's just something that I'm, I love so much that I wanted to not just give back, but I, I wanted to to see uprisen the, the things that, that really I, I hold dear and I wanted to, to promote that in kind of my own way. So it's every project I've done, I've tried to do better than the last. That's really my end goal is that each book I make, I just wanna make it a little bit better than the one before it. Um, try to get a wider audience, try to broaden the, the field of speculative fiction a little bit more. Which is interesting because, and we're going to get into this series, but one of the things that I, I really appreciated as somebody who's read all five books in this series is that the consistency is one of the things that, that, um, that I really am drawn to on it. But we'll get back to that. Uh, Michael, now you um, teach uh, writing and you got into, in, in, as an academic, that's kind of your role in this series. How did you get into into teaching? Like, you know, why did you take that path? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I just, you know, when I, I mentioned before I was in the military when I started like reading a lot and, and you know, trying to be a horror writer. And then when I finished uh, my time in, in the army, I had all this college money. So I went to college <laughs> uh, and it was for free basically at that point. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was going to major in, but I ended up majoring in English because I just loved talking about books. I just loved being in the classroom with people who had read the same story and, and, and we could have conversations and debates about what we'd read, you know. Uh, it was a big contrast from when I was alone in the field. I was like the only one reading books for pleasure, you know. And so, I mean, it was just, I felt like I'd found my, my tribe. And I just kept going to school, <laughs> you know? I said, I'm gonna keep going until I burn out, uh, you know? And, um, you know, and I kind of saw teaching as a gig I picked up on the side to help me fund my creative writing, you know? So I went to the uh, University of Idaho to do my master's degree uh, and it, it was very eye-opening. I, I just thought, oh, I'll write my second novel here, you know, while they pay me to teach and take classes. Um, and it, along the way, I kind of fell in love with teaching and teaching horror is very special. You know, you don't always get the opportunity to do that. And somehow, magically, I, I landed at Seton Hill University, which has a um, MFA degree in writing popular fiction. And I get to work with graduate students who are writing horror novels. It's like dream come true. Uh, and I keep doing that um, as well as, you know, it involves researching the genre, which is something I started doing in my PhD work, which focused on the uncanny in literature and in multimedia and things like that. Anyway, uh, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've come at horror as kind of a, uh, a way of seeing the world. And so uh, I've made a whole career, I think, out of doing it on multiple levels, but horror has always been at the center of it. So whether it's a scholarly thing or a creative writing project, 
editing, I've done that too. Uh, you know, these are just, uh, they're all related to my fascination with the genre. All right, so um, Eric, now this series, um, how did you come up with the idea for this series and the format? Did, did, was it fully formed idea with the format or was that something that developed over time? Definitely the, the format kind of developed over time of, of brainstorming di different ideas. So it's, I, I, I pretty much everything I do is I, I look at it in, in a very fluid, flexible process. Um, a lot of times I'll just start jotting down notes and I'll, I'll start doing layouts of, of books and, you know, on, in Word documents. I'll, I'll play around with images, just download templates let it sit for a couple of weeks, work on something else, come back and try to look at it in a, in a fresh perspective. So definitely a, a fluid process. Um, I wanted, as you mentioned, there's kind of a consistency amongst the volumes. So to me, that was a very important quality from the beginning that somebody who reads volume after volume, they would have a certain level of expectations of what to see. So I really, that was a very important element that I didn't want to start on this journey until I did have some sort of a, a format laid out and I would have kind of the, the same individuals working through it, um, the same feel because I love series. I love collecting books um, that have that, that similar um, feel to them and, and the similar look. It's almost, you know, it's like a, you know, like a child collecting items, collecting baseball cards. So I wanted it to, to um, look the same across the board, but that the content, it's the voice of the author of each volume is unique in, in their own way. And that's kind of the highlight of, of what drives the, from one book to the next. Right, and now that I've read five volumes that have Michael's commentary, I kind of wish every short story collection I ever read had Michael's commentary on it. Um, but, uh, you know, I know that would be a lot of work for you, Michael, but- uh, well, ironically, everything I read has my commentary on it in the margin. So. <laughs> well, <we're laughs> Maybe someday you'll be able to see it, I don't know. <laughs> right. Um, well, and so, but that's one of the highlights and earlier that had to, you know, when did that idea come to you and, and become a part of this process? Was that question to me, David, or to, to Michael? Uh, no, I think as the publisher and editor, I would say that's for you. Like, how did you come upon Michael? Like, what, what was, what did Michael bring to the table that you wanted to, you know, bring his commentary into it? Oh, uh, besides that charming mug there. <laughs> Look at those rosy cheeks. Besides, besides that, no, Michael just has, he has such a stellar reputation in the uh, horror genre community. Um, I, I wanted somebody who actually had an academic background. There's a lot of authors who give um, fantastic commentary without having the academic background. And, and uh, you know, naturally it's, it's not a necessity, but part of my audience from the beginning when I thought, who do I want to market these books to and where do I want to see them ultimately land? Part of it is that I wanted them to be in the classrooms. I wanted to be able to market these towards libraries, public libraries, as well as school libraries, and then um, English and creative writing classes at the high school and the college level. And I really felt that it would, it would just kind of add that, that level of credibility to at least have somebody who has a PhD, who has gone through all of, all of the same steps that the, the readers may, may be reading. So besides having the academic credentials, Besides, he already has such a reputation in the field. Michael's been teaching. He's been writing um, essays for, I don't, I don't want to date him. I don't know how many years, 30 years, 40 years. He just has a, 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 a history. You know, I personally, I really value the, the stories, the fiction, as well as the nonfiction that I've read of his. And he's just awesome to work with. I mean, that's really the most, most important part of any collaboration project is that you have to have some sort of a rapport and enjoy working with, with the other individuals on the project. And so Michael, hey. what was it like for you to get this invitation and what did you think about the project when, when, when it was first brought to you? Well, my cheeks are rosy because I'm blushing. That was awesome, Eric. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, I don't think I deserve so much credit, but it is true. It's kind of rare to have PhDs working in the field, like, you know, 
and Eric, I mostly got in touch with through the Horror Writers Association and and just going to horror conventions. And you know, he he's a he's a charming person and uh, knows his stuff. Uh, you know, both of us have won multiple Bram Stoker awards. I think because people trust us as you know voices in the genre. So so there's that. Uh, but when Eric approached me with this idea, I was like, this is awesome. This is exactly what I wanted to see in the college libraries when I was going to colleges as a student, both as an undergraduate and a graduate student. Uh, you know, some focus on short fiction. It seems like most of the academic writing is on either horror films that dominates and then novels. And I understand why novels are kind of, you know, they're works of a high achievement. It is difficult to write a novel. Uh, it is difficult to write, write a horror novel that can change the world of literature. But so many writers kind of, uh, you know, they, they, get their, they get their chops by writing short fiction. And, you know, in the classroom, in the college classroom especially, and in most writers' workshops, people are writing short stories. I mean, that's how people learn to write fiction. Uh, it's very rare for someone to just say, oh, I'm going to write a novel, and then they write a novel. Uh, you get kind of practice um, through short stories. And in horror, it's so central to the genre. I mean, you know, think about Edgar Allan Poe and how he pretty much launched what, what we do. Uh, and he's a short story writer. And so uh, to me, that's really the crux of why this series is so great, is because it heralds short fiction in the horror genre. And it does it in a classy way, a smart way. Um, and it also really, uh, I mean, just it puts authors on a pedestal. You know, Eric interviews them. He invites them to write new material for each book. Uh, they con contribute a new, usually, essay to the book. So it's not just me doing all the nonfiction. I mean, you know, I have a, I'm, I'm part of the book because I'm kind of like the reader. I mean, I, I'm kind of like, in the position of the reader talking about the stories. Uh, but really what Eric does in partnership with these authors, from selecting them to organizing and kind of uh, architecting this whole book around them that, that just celebrates the author's uh, vision and uh, life work as a short story author. That's really unique and special. And so I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of this series. I, I love working on it and I'll do whatever I can to support it. Right, and so let's get into the actual books. So um, we're going to start by talking about, and if you're on YouTube, you can see the primer for Steve Rasnick Tem. Now, I'm a huge fan of Tem's um, novel. Um, is it Ubu? Or I'm just, I'm just making sure I say it right. Which was a great science fiction horror novel, um, uh, incredible, a couple years ago. But I've been a fan of his short fiction by seeing him in anthologies for forever. And, um, and really, he is known also because he wrote a lot of excellent fiction with his, his late wife, Melanie, who was also a fantastic author as well. So um, Eric, why Steve Resnick Tim first? I understand why, certainly why you would do a book on him, but why did you want to launch this series with him? Um, coincidentally, I had, I had recently had correspondence with him. Um, he had written a, an original story for me for an anthology that I made called After Death that explored the variety of ways that, you know, methods and things that may await us after our, our great demise. And he's just such a thoughtful, caring, understanding individual um, likewise, he has a, a stellar reputation in the industry, and um, as you know, as you mentioned, he's been writing short stories for, likewise, 40 years uh, and beyond. So, because he, I had been working with him already, uh, I thought it would be easy, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's challenging to reach out to an author or somebody you've never worked with before, to begin a giant large project. It, it kind of makes sense to have the stepping stone. You know, you might, you might work with them a little bit on a short story or have an interview with them just to kind of get a feel for each other. So I felt like I already had that rapport. Um, 
and Steve Rasnick Tam has been inspiring me. I've read his short fiction since I was in high school. So I just looked at him that he, his writing epitomizes what I envisioned for the series because he writes in a lot of different genres and he writes, his writing is very quiet. It's not in your face. It's not, a, you know, offensively loud. It's, he likes to explore a lot of different issues in the world and he likes to explore a lot of different emotions. His writing is very emotionally resonant while expanding the mind. Um, he just has the kind of writing that if you don't like one story, you could put it down and the next one you're gonna love. And they just, they go back and forth. The one thing that's consistent though is just kind of that quality of very, very slow introspective understanding. And uh, I just thought he'd be a great lead off in, into the books. I, I hope readers will agree. Oh yeah, I think he, he, was, he was definitely a great place to start. And um, so let's get into some of the stories. Um, one that I, you know, really wanted to highlight, there are two with the Steve Resnick 10 story that I want to talk about. One is The Giveaway, which is pretty much a, a flash fiction piece. But one of the things that uh, Michael pointed out in his commentary is that it showcases in a very subtle way some feminist tendencies. And it's, it's kind of a subtle feminist piece in a, in a way. Um, and it reminded me of, you know, so, some of the best horror short stories. I'm thinking of, for example, Red by R.C. Matheson, which is like a page and a half, but incredibly powerful, you know, shows great examples of what a very short story can do. I'm wondering if you guys have any comment on on the story, the giveaway, because to me, that was that was one of the strong ones in this this collection. Maybe starting with Eric. Uh, I was just gonna say, oh, let's let's hear what Michael has to say. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off by saying, I love you know I I select the stories along with the author, but I I try to I try to ask the author you know these are the the stories that I want to include because I think across their scope, not only for this volume, but across the entire series, they're going to have some, some similar themes um, while it going in different directions. So you'll have stories that may explore mythology. You may have stories that have origin stories, stories that explore, um, you know, individual um, challenges that are met or ghosts or devils or folklore. And a lot of times, I won't even have the, I don't have the level of understanding that Michael will have. So when I send these stories over to Michael, when I read back his commentary, it helps me to understand these stories on a, on a, on a different level that I didn't even grasp the first time. So something like the giveaway, I looked at this in terms of, of family fears, of the, the children's fears of the parents, because I'm a parent and I, and I have young children. And, and at the time of this, I see a lot of fears that I recognized as a youth. And I think based on my own experiences and, and then the, the reminisce of those experiences, seeing that in, in my children's eyes, that there are certain stories that work for me on one different way. But then I read Michael's take on them and I, and I realize, you know what? This story also works on such, on such a different um, method. And to be honest, I've never gone back to Steve Rasnick Tam and asked him, am I right? Or is Michael Arnzen right? Or are both of us right? Or does this story mean something completely differently? I've never taken it to that, that level. And I think that would be a really interesting conversation to have. And I think that's the same with, with a lot of good literature is that, especially for stories that are subtle and the weird, is they're open to interpretation. They could speak to a lot of different issues because people are gonna read them and they're gonna grasp, they're gonna latch onto something and what they latch onto in the beginning, that's going to mold how the story works for them by its ending and by its closure. Well, and the giveaway is a story, it's kind of a reversal because a lot of stories are about losing children. And this story is about losing a parent, right? Um, at least that's kind of the take I had on it. Michael. Uh, yeah, it's almost like a modern fairy tale, like a, like a very tragic fairy tale. It's a cautionary tale. If you don't do something, 
somebody else is going to pay the price for you for that. Yeah, Michael, um, any thoughts on this story? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's been a while since I've read that one, but, uh, you know, that's the one. I don't want to ruin it for people who are going to still buy the book. So, But it has it, this is what Steve Resnick Tem is good at a twist ending. I mean, it's, it, it's hard. I don't want to give away the ending because it's so, it gets you, <laughs> you know? So aside oh, from oh, like- for a flash fiction piece, you could give away the ending on a flash fiction. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, it works on, like Eric was saying, it works on multiple levels. I mean, because good authors invite interpretation and kind of can create these stories where we read into them and it invites us and encourages us to kind of map our own meaning out of it. Now in this one, like you, like Eric brought up, it's about parenting, right? And kind of a, there's a reversal, as you said, with uh, how we are afraid of our parents leaving us. Uh, so it's really a tale of abandonment anxiety. Um, and I don't wanna get into the plot of it, I guess, but uh, this is, it points back to Steve Thames uh, kind of ingenious manipulation of psychology. He is so facile with building up our identification, that emotional resonance that Eric mentioned, and then using that to not only kind of uh, throw us off guard with where we predict the ending is going to go, but also kind of get us to kind of do a reversal on our own assumptions about things and to question, you know, why, why did I think this was how it was gonna end? And I, throughout that whole book, I think he does that consistently, all the stories. I mean, the first story in that collection, Hungry, to me is like, that's a mind blowing story and everyone should read that. That should be compulsory reading, especially for little children. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah Hungry is a great story actually. And, and um, the last moments before bed, uh, the story is, um, is an incredible story about grief. And obviously, I, I'm sure um, Steve probably wrote that right after, probably when he was dealing with the grief and the loss of his wife, you know, which, you know, is something that we all as a community grieved when we lost Melanie Tem. She was a great writer. And I, so I think. I think that for those of us who are long-term horror uh, short fiction readers, I think there's a, a, an added element um, to reading that particular story. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I think the Tim collection is, is um, you know, I mean, and, and then I, I'm wondering too, was there in the nonfiction parts of, of, of actually sitting down and writing about Tim and doing the interview, what was the most revealing process or part of the process of this book, specifically to getting to the heart of Tem as, as an artist? Oh, man, I don't, have, go? <laughs> I don't have a, I don't have a, a, a answer to that, that right off, off the top of my head. I, I love interviews with authors. So I mean, there, you kind of mentioned two different parts. As far as the essay is concerned, I actually let the author select any essay that they've previously written that they would just like to re-include in this book. So in this case, you know, Steve, Steve went through and he, he selected an essay about writing, but I wanted the authors to have a little bit of say about their own voice and about the things that they wanted to promote in this book um, you know, something that might mean a lot or something that they want to give a little bit wider audience to. But then as far as the, the interview is concerned, um, again, I love interviews with authors because I love to read about those questions about understanding the process, understanding the things that they go through, the things that they think about, because myself as a writer, that means a lot to me. It, it, they're kind of hints to me of this great splendor that, you know, someday I can achieve. Or maybe they've made mistakes along the process that I can learn from and that so I won't emulate those mistakes. So all of the interview questions, I, I try to have fun with them, with some of them. I try to also make them, you know, a few of them very deep and kind of resonant questions. I tend to go online and in books and I'll read several other interview formats with the authors so that I'm not asking the same questions that they're asked over and over again, but maybe something that's 
that might tie into their, their past experiences, but also something unique and something new that um, readers may not have learned or have known about the author previously. All right, um, Michael, do you have any last comments on Steve Resnick 10 before we move on to book number two? I mean, not really. I, th I think he's one of those authors that you see him in the pages of anthologies in genre literature everywhere. So what's great about this book is that it gives you this like, uh, he, he's a good story writer. I want to learn more. This is the book to get because it gives you the kind of whole picture of him and yet has this very kind of special, as Eric was saying, uh, kind of clustering of stories because the author themselves select them. They add a story to it, which makes me feel like they're kind of filling some gap that might be there with the other four stories. Like maybe they're trying to do something like that. I don't know. I don't know what their logic is for selecting the stories they, they pick. But in that Steve Rasnick 10 uh, original contribution, it's a Christmas story, folks. So you should get this book for Christmas. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's like, I wish I could write Christmas stories that good. <laughs> it's tough to do. All right, so book number two is the primer to Karen Warren, who, uh, right, everybody hold up their copies for the, the tubers. I'm, I'm gonna be, um, I'm, David, I'm going to just give a quick aside. I've, I think you, and you have the paperback copies, but I also right. make special laminate-based um, hardback editions that are just oh. these, these gorgeous, I love just the weight of them and, and the series feel. So again, two different formats, the paperback and then the, the hardcover editions also. So that's why the difference for readers is that they see one with the red stripe and one with the black stripe. These are really nice paperbacks. So I'm not, I'm not complaining. Um, <laughs> so Karen, Karen Warren, for me, um, she's an Australian author and I had read her debut, at least as far as I know, debut novel Slights. It was a debut international novel. She may have had some before that that were not published internationally. But, um, and I loved that book, which I thought was like a weird, I thought it was like a Chuck Palahniuk style ghost story is kind of the way I described it at the time um, because the characters were so out there. But, um, and it was, you know, uh, uh, the book was very successful. I heard a lot of people talking about it in the horror community, but uh, at the same time, she's not a house household name. And even within the horror community, I don't think she's as well known as, as your Steve Rasnick Tem would be. So um, what was with the, the I, it, it felt to me like you were trying to kind of lay down the gauntlet on the international nature that you were going for with book two. Um, Eric, am I correct on that? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, I, I definitely wanted to, I mean, as an American and raised on American writing, there's there's thousands, literally thousands of, of authors that I could, I could go through just, just in, in America because that's what I was raised on and, and that's what I love. But part of this series as well um, to kind of opening up the genre to others, it also opens it up for myself. So it helps me to explore other communities and I love learning. I love learning about uh, new mythology and I love learning about, about new ideas. And there really are just so many amazing authors in other countries that I wasn't familiar with um, before, but you know, purposefully reaching out and looking through these authors, I come, I come upon just absolutely mind blowing work. So I had been putting together an anthology specific to that, that it was called a world of horror. And that was an anthology just of short stories that were non-themed horror by authors all across the globe. So I did reach out to Karen Warren to write a, a story for me for, set in Australia. And I was already familiar with a lot of her other short story work from, from um, different anthologies. But she, again, she was a, such a wonderful person. Just a, She was a joy to work with. Just somebody, when you, you have email correspondences and you talk business and you may, you know, sometimes you, you tend to just open up a little bit more. And I felt, I just felt this wonderful rapport with her that I could joke with her and she's very open. We could share feedback and it just really clicked with me that I thought Karen Warren would just be absolutely perfect 
for a new volume of females per, um, work, um, Australia, the other side of the globe, somebody who, I mean, she is, she may not be as well known in America, but she is immensely popular in Australia. I think she's won more genre fiction awards in Australia than, than any other author. I'm not positive. I don't want to take anything away from any other authors, but I know she's at least up there and well deserve it just because her, her back catalog of work, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really something special to go through and read her work. It's just, it, it tugs at a lot of heartstrings. She deals with a lot of very um, terrifying, tragic, sad, ghostly works. And I think that's kind of a, a common unifying theme across her, her works. Right, and uh, one of, I think, probably more so than any other of the books in the series, the finding out about her life <laughs> just made, uh, made it so much more interesting. Um, finding out about her experience with Harry Krishna's and like her, her personal story like added so much to, to the process of, or, you know, it, for somebody who writes such delightfully weird stuff, it, it made me go, hmm, okay, I see now. Yeah. I, I yeah see. She has an amazing backstory, her life story of growing up. It's, yeah, it's it's something different. Right. And now, of the stories in her collection that were my, the one that was my favorite is Cri Crisis Apparition. Um, I believe that's how it's... Ap yeah, Crisis Apparition. Yeah. Um, now this, she talks about the creation of this in the interview. And I think for that reason, I think this particular story more than any other in the series is one that's really great for authors to read, to see about taking inspiration and constructing a whole story from the inspiration process. Cause she did a great job of explaining in the interview where the inspiration came from. So Michael, as a teacher, like, uh, you know, what do you take away from, from this story and um, and, and this author. Well, <clears throat> Karen Warren was n relatively new to me uh, when Eric shared her work uh, for me to write about. And so it was a joy to kind of learn and discover a new author from overseas. Uh, and, you know, like Nissy Shaw, uh, who is the next author in the series, I think Karen Warren is doing some interesting things as a, as a female author uh, maybe to a, a, there's a degree to which she's an intersectional author. She's, she's representing different kind of subject positions and identities. Um, but but for me, like Missy Shaw, what she's doing that's unique and kind of amazing is drawing on uh, mythology and stories from her region of the world in a way that makes them universally accessible for readers like me who are, might be new to her work. Uh, and it, it, you know, it cracks open a new doorway in the back of your brain. Where you're like, oh, I never really thought about things that way before. And my God, did she just tell a story about thousands of years? <laughs> did she just capture a thousands of years, a millennium in a short story? Oh my God. And I cracked the whole life story of this character through a thousand years. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's not crisis apparition. It's one of the first stories in the collection that kind of set with me the longest. But Crisis Apparition, I believe, is uh, her original con contribution to the book. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's a good ghost story. Uh, I actually was like, what's with that title, though? So I like had to do a Google search. I'm like, oh, this is she's drawing from actual kind of, you know, parapsychology here about crisis apparitions that people see ghosts at moments of crisis. I was like, this explains the story for me. <laughs> So it was one of those things where I had to do a little research on my own to understand that one. That was but, the same uh, with me. I, I was not familiar with the crisis <laughs> apparition, but it is it is a real um, psychological phenomenon. So reading into that, uh, I think I, I kind of fell down the rabbit hole of research and, and understanding that when people experience these life tragedies, they will actually envision the ghosts that are, that are walking alongside them and, and are leading them through, through their decisions. And there's a whole realm of, of first person experiences that in, in these moments of crises, how they, how they interact with, with ghostly figures around them. And yeah, it's, yeah, it really, it, 
it made the story read on a completely different level. Yeah, and um, I I didn't realize it was the original piece for the for the anthology. That's great. It's um, it is definitely one one of the um, strongest short stories in the entire series, let alone in Karen Karen Warren's book. But um, now this is an interesting uh, segue, which is on the back of the books is a uh, coming. And like here it says coming in 2018, number three is a pri uh, primer for Nissi Shawl. And that prompted me uh, at the time to use the book correctly and go and read Everfair, <laughs> um, the, <laughs> Nissi Shawl's novel, because I had not heard of this author. And I said, okay, um, eventually I'm going to read this, <laughs> this collection. I should see what she's got. And I went to the library and I got Everfair. Um, which I admit is not entirely like my style of subgenre of science fiction in the sense that I'm not a big steampunk fan and, and alt history, and when it gets that far back in period, it's not my favorite period. Um, however, I can't take away from the writing of the book. The writing of the book is incredible. It's just not my, you know, it's not my cup of tea, but it's a very good cup of tea. I realize that. <laughs> But what was cool was um, the primer, of course, was great. <laughs> and when I got to it, uh, that's, that's the important thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, no, listen, I'm not going to take away from from this woman's writing. She's obviously a really great writer. She's just writing in a, in, you know, like I'm a Philip K. Dick cyberpunk weird freak out sci-fi writer. That's generally, you know, John Bruner is my jam for sci-fi and. Um, so, you know, I just had to recognize that I can, you know, game recognizes game. I recognize game there, but uh, it's just not my thing per se. But part of what it is, is that Nissy Shaw writes really great folklore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dark fiction. And, um, and yes, it's not entirely my thing, but I think it's great. Um, and I think my favorite story in this particular collection, the one that really, really got me and where I was super impressed was the story Otherwise, which is which is my jam because it's post-apocalyptic, which yeah. is one of my favorite genres. And this story is set after a massive EMP and um, it's the most straightforward narrative of the stories that are in here. Um, and that's, but that's not to say that there isn't depth going on because there is. But beyond the grim setup is a really great look at class divisions and consumerism. So I want to point out that those levels that I think are going on there that I really appreciated. So either one of you guys can jump in first, but what was it like working on this book with Nissy Shaw? And you know, why did you pick her for, for this volume? And what were your favorite elements of it? Um uh, I'm, I'm going to jump in and start off just because I'm so ex excited to say that, of course, I mean, Nisi, Nisi is is just so incredibly gracious. She's she's very um, thoughtful, uh, uh, kind all the way around. And I'm going to take a moment just to say, I'm I'm going to kind of you know give, give myself a little little uh, clap on the back because I think the strength of this series and these books and something that I've done right is that whenever I talk to different readers about these books, they all share that they like different stories that I selected. There's no one book in the series that everybody says, this is the one story that absolutely is the best out of the bunch. Whenever I talk to people, and to me, this is the mark of a good anthology, is that you have a wide audience, so everybody's gonna look at these stories differently, but all the stories speak to different, different people. So that otherwise really resonated with you. And I love that story because I love post-apocalyptic post tales as well. But personally, what drew me to Nisi is that I love the folklore. I love that she write, that she modernizes folklore and she takes folklore in these kind of horror directions and these weird surreal directions. And I also, I love alternate history. So she mixes folklore and alternate history so the way that I became familiar with Everfair was that she had written first written a, a story that I read through Nightmare Magazine. I can't, I can't say first, but it was 
I first read it called Vulcanization. So it was a short story through Nightmare Magazine that, that tied into the book. And I thought, man, what? She's crossed so many realms of magic realism, alternate history, steampunk, horror, thrillers. And it still has this message of, of racial divide, political intrigue. And I, I'm really, I'm very impressed by authors that can find ways to kind of have this slipstream where they can talk to a lot of different people in different and impactful ways. Um, so to backtrack, yeah, again, um, Nisi is, she's, she's great to, to work with. Going back, one of the joys of, of this series is that I immerse myself in the author's short stories. So I go back and I read their, I read their collections and I read the, the work that they've had uh, anthologized. And I, I just find so many different stories that I think, yeah, I feel like I understand the, the author on a much better level by looking at their work as, as a whole. So I'll, I'll pass the, the baton over to Mr. Arnzen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, geez, what, what more can be said? I mean, that short story uh, otherwise is post-apocalyptic, but it's, I mean, it's just a damn good <laughs> story because she takes things like as a reader, you might assume that she's doing all these political things and she is, but she makes it so damn entertaining. She flips the script on what you think she's going to do as an activist writer. And, um, you know, she really represents kind of the, the ways that people are kind of not just oppressed, but are, we're, we're, we're always sliding between different levels of oppression and power. Sometimes we're on top, sometimes we're on the bottom. And there are all these layers to what it means to be who we are. And that story takes it and projects it out onto a social environment where the conflicts play out in an interesting way. So that is a great story. I mean, it's, a, it's an accomplishment uh, that she wrote. It's a little long. It's a little long, Eric. I don't know. Is it short fiction? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Novelettes are okay in the series. Novelettes are okay. And, and the reason for that is because, you know, uh, the selections that you're, you make, Eric, they're very uh, diverse. And I know I, David would agree that, I mean, the Missy Shaw collection really cinches it, that this whole series is representing writers of different stripes and, and personalities and approaches. And in the Nisi Shaw book, uh, the stories are all vastly different. There's some recurring characters and things, but like you said, like she, she's mixing magical realism with horror and science fiction, slipstream, everything. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, this book, when I first got the manuscripts to read, kind of shocked me a little because I'm like, uh-oh, Eric is pushing us into science fiction now. This is not what I was expecting. I thought we'd go darker. <laughs> I thought it was going to get into like satanic, you know, like again, goat slaughter or something. But instead it went into like, you know, this post-apocalyptic story of a, uh, an alternative like drug culture where people have like decided to take drugs and opt out of society, but only the rich people can do that. It's like really a weird, weird setup for, I mean, I think in my write-up I called it Huxleyan because it's a lot like Aldous Huxley, uh, you know, Brave New World kind of premise but it's done in like an action story kind of way. So I don't know, David, I, I mean, I'm just kind of scattered all over my answer, but you know, that is a, a great story in the book. They're all good, they're all weird. And so yeah. as much as it's science fiction, it's, it's just weird. <laughs> and well, she does so, it with authority, so that's great. And I appreciate breaking down the walls between science fiction and horror because I think that needs to happen more and all the time. Um, you know, where was that line in the Twilight Zone? It didn't exist, you know, so so for me, um, as somebody who kind of sees them as two sides of one coin and kind of consider myself, for example, as an artist, as an author myself, I just, I love science fiction and horror equally. Um, I like to study both and I like, you know, kind of take the scholarship of, of and the history of the genre seriously when i say the genre i think of both so i got no problem there i i was very happy with like the walls coming down uh, here in book three 
Um, but a little bit more traditional horror in book four with um, the primer to Jeffrey Ford, um, who um, I admit I had read Jeffrey Ford, but not a ton of, and I don't think I had ever written it in, or read an entire volume of before. So this was my first time reading um, a volume. So that's two authors. Well, three, well, yeah, two authors. No, I guess I did read for the last two because, but partially because of the series, the last one. But, um, but in, in any case, uh, Jeffrey Ford, um, why uh, Jeffrey Ford next, Eric? Um, once again, I happened to have been working with him at that moment in time. Um, I was the editor in, for an anthology called The Horror Library, Volume 6. And I had uh, invited uh, Jeffrey to, to write a story for it. And, uh, and of course, it was, it, was, it was great. And I started to realize, I, you know, sometimes it's just one of those things that an author just doesn't necessarily, I don't want to say click with you, but you don't really, you don't really realize the, the breadth of work. Kind of like when you hear a word, like a certain word, that all of a sudden you realize, man, I see that word on all the billboards around, around us. And it's, I don't know, I'm kind of going off on that. Let, let me backtrack for a moment. I, I started reading, I started looking more into Jeffrey Ford and I realized I have loved his work for years and years and years because he is in volume after volume of the year's best fiction by Ellen Datlow, by Paula Grant by Stephen Jones. He's regularly anthologized. He's, he wins award after award. Every time I read a story, I'm like, this is an amazing story. But for some reason, his name just kind of fell off, would fall off the radar and I'd read the next story, but I wouldn't register that he had written the previous story because his stories are so different. They're, they're this, he started off as, as a, some background to him, he started off as a, prof, as a literary professor and he started doing very, very literary style writing. So then once he started exploring into the weird and, and the horror, he brings this literary sensibility to it where the structure of these stories are just ingenious. He's developed a reputation of building stories within a story. And I think that's really key is that they're almost like, they're almost like architectural in, in, their, in their elements because you're building one layer upon another layer upon another layer, and then it all kind of backtracks and, and it all ties in. And I actually would find myself just studying his writing. Like I could sit there and study the poetry of one line and how it, how it reads into the next line and the underlying concepts that he's speaking to. And there's a lot of back and forth between the beauty of prose and the message that he's sharing, um, the history that, that he's bringing in with, with all of these literary sensibilities, while at the same time, just reaching out for the wildest of ideas, just topics that you would think if anybody else was gonna write about this, it would just be stupid. That's all he could say is like, that's the most ridiculous thing. Dude. Nobody in their right mind is gonna pull that off. But then Jeffrey Ford does it and at the ending, you just think, dude, I, I'm going to cry. This was just so beautifully done. And I, I've never read anything so, so special before. Well, and that's exactly my reaction to my favorite story in the piece, which is the Boatman's Holiday. And, um, you know, to do a story about hell and the river sticks is pretty tricky because it could be really ridiculous if, you know, like you said, and that uh, balance between being you know, like how dark are you going to make it? When does it become goofy? It's a very hard thing to strike. And, but when it, when the story's over, there's a, a real dark beauty to that, yeah. that piece. Um, it's a mystery. Not only is it, not only is it very subtly horror, it's not really horror on its nature, except that it takes place down in Hades, but it's almost this, this tragedy of Sharon and it's a mystery. It's, whole, it's a whole mystery wrapped up in the human condition and wrapped up with the nature of good versus evil 
how, as how it was developed by humanity and, and their creation of God and the devil. And man, it's, it's, it's mind blowing for sure. Uh, Michael, your thoughts on, uh, on the Jeffrey Ford uh, book? If there's one book you get, <laughs> this is the one because I mean, I, I don't mean to rank them like that, but this book is astonishingly good. He is an amazing author and it's kind of mind blowing that he does fall under the radar, like Eric said, and I know why it is. It's because his name is so damn generic, <laughs> Jeffrey Ford. I'm sorry, I, it's I, a forgettable name, Jeffrey. It You're watching, it's like, you know, it's it's just it's one of those names and you're like wait a minute was that the movie director john ford was that henry the ford? creator of the automobile yeah, yeah. And, and so it's hard to kind of like you hear a name missy shawl you remember that mm -hmm. jeffrey ford it's slippery it, 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 it could be anybody so i'm sorry jeffrey ford <laughs> your name is your bane you need you should have had a like you should have been Jeffrey Q. Ford or something like that. It really would stick in people's minds. Now, I don't mean to belabor that point, but I think it's true <laughs> um, in, you know, in terms of readers' memories. You know, we need that branding a little bit. Um, but if you stick around, if you read the anthologies, like the years best all the time, you're going to see his name ping your radar a lot. And then pretty soon you're like, oh, my God. It's that genius, Jeffrey Ford. And now you can't wait to read another story with that yeah. byline. He is amazing. Never now, I did let like, down by his work. Yeah. Never let down. Yeah. I just bought like his trilogy. I don't even remember the, the name of it. I started it. Like, two days ago. That's it. Again, genius. I mean, I can't stop reading. Uh, Boatman, Boatman's Boatman. Holiday is an amazing story, David. Uh, that's a good one to point out because it's just like, Again, it's drawing from myth like Missy Shaw was, would do or Karen Warren, but he does it in his own way. And, um, you know, you really just identify with, <laughs> with the boatman on the river sticks who has to travel these souls around and he wants to kind of escape and go off the beaten path for it, you know, just to see what's, a, a, I don't want to give away the story, <laughs> but it's an interesting story. Um, yeah. You know, but all of the stories are unforgettable in that book. What do you want? That, I'm that's sorry. the one that sold me on him. And and so you mentioned he has a trilogy of novels. Is is this or, um, and what are they called? Because I'm going to be looking for them. It's called the Well Built City yep. trilogy, and I'm going to draw a blank on the titles because I just bought the collection. Is the, the physic the physical no, no, I don't know how to pronounce it. Physic nominee. I apologize. Uh, off the top of my I think head. that's the first book in the series, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the titles get easier to, to say. The Beyond. Book three, The Beyond. <laughs> okay, Obviously. well, I'm, I'm interested now. So, uh, but yeah, the Jeffrey Ford, um, yeah, very impressive collection. That story, um, Bowman's Holiday, definitely was the one that, that sold me um, on, on, that was, that was a wowzer. <laughs> that was a wowzer story. Um, and, uh, um, well, I don't know, the... I'm, I'm going to be doing a, um, I'm going to be doing a panel next year on, uh, best horror short stories of all time. And, and uh, not an honorable, if, if it doesn't make the list, it's definitely gonna be on the honorable mentions for sure. Um, when, 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 uh, when I get down to it. So, um, and that everyone's just gonna have to wait for next spring because, that's a lot of work for me. So, because I've got to reread a bunch of stories to make sure I'm happy with my list. So, um, but, uh, and I have some, some, some people in mind who I really want to invite to do that episode that, uh, so I'm going to tease that a little bit. Now, the final book so far in the series, um, and you know, it's funny, right until I held in my hands, I had not looked to see who number six was. And now I'm just like, ooh. Uh, <laughs> but number five, this is the one I was most looking forward to from when I saw the name of it and because um, I do love Asian fiction and I am um, particularly a fan of Chinese science fiction. And Han Sung is more known for science fiction, although the, the line, that Twilight Zone blurred line between science fiction and horror in China is even more razor thin than anywhere <laughs> anywhere else. Um, and uh, 
I personally got into reading Chinese uh, science fiction from reading Invisible Planets, the anthology edited by um, Ken Liu. And that anthology in particular has a novelette in there called Folding Beijing, which is one of the best short stories I've ever read by Hao Jin Fang. And I just read her novel, Vagabond. So I read Vagabonds, which was 600 page Chinese science fiction novel and Hansung back to back. So I'm in a serious Chinese sci-fi mood uh, right now. But this Hansung collection, now I just said this in my review, so I'm sure this is fresh in you guys' mind, but I basically, I threw down a gauntlet with Hansung saying he was the Chinese Brian Evanson. <laughs> and uh, Brian Evanson is, right. to me, um, you know, if Clive Barker was, when I was growing up, Clive Barker, I thought was the best horror author of short fiction going when he was writing the books of blood. And I think right now, Brian Evanson might be, in my opinion, I think any corpse might be one of the best short, 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 horror short stories I've read in the last decade. That being said, I think Han Song has a very similar style because that line between science fiction, horror, surrealism, especially the surrealist part, um, is very much there. Now, Han Song does go into kind of cosmic territory a little bit more than, than Brian Evanson does. And, but it's funny because, and, and since I did some research and I listened to a podcast that, that one of your translators was on, Han Song has entire, he's basically got a story about every method of transportation where someone's stuck. <laughs> you know, That's funny. <laughs> yeah, he has a story where people are stuck on a plane forever. He has a story that- yeah, A lot of subway stories stuck yeah. in the subway. I think that speaks to their culture. Yeah, and so his subway story here was my favorite story. Um, I'm I that one I did not write down the title. I'm I'm sure if I look at the table of contents, I'll see it. Oh, the transformation subway. subway. Yeah, incredible story. Very surreal, um, and it used one of my favorite methods of writing a short story. And I. Um, I taught a class in writing horror short stories one time a couple of years ago at a film fest and I used The Raft by Stephen King. Mm. And I talked about, you know, how sometimes building suspense is like rungs in a ladder and you're climbing it and you have to have, you have to establish each rung as it goes up. And one of the things I loved about the transformation subway is that the rungs of the ladder are so well defined yeah. in this story. Um, so why Hansung? How did you? I did a lot of talking there, but it, it's fresh in my head. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I appreciate that because I like to hear the perspective of, of somebody else. You know, a lot of times doing the, these projects, it, it feels like a very small bubble. You, you, mm -hmm. read, you read reviewers' comments. They tend to be favorable, maybe a paragraph or two, but I don't really get to hear the chance of kind of the, the inner workings of, of the mind as a, as a reader is going through this and you know what it means to them. And especially for somebody who says that they're well-versed in the, in the Chinese science fiction um, genre, which admittedly I am not. Um, I do not have that, that background knowledge base of, of Asian uh, genre fiction in general, which is really one of the reasons why I wanted to go this direction for, for this volume. I wanted to explore um, the the um, kind of the Asian inner workings of of what they consider dark dark fantasy or dark fiction horror. So to your point, um, Han Song again, he's considered and he's said to be a science fiction writer. He's labeled as one of the three top contemporary uh, Chinese science fiction authors. Um, in the world right now. But it's also important to note that his, they, the um, Chinese fiction does not recognize horror as a genre. So there is no horror writing in, in Chinese fiction. They incorporate horror into science fiction. So although they call him as, a, as one of the greatest science fiction authors, he, as you read through these stories, a lot of these stories, they're what we in America would just flat out say, that's a horror story. 
And it's because he's able to bridge this by looking kind of outside some of these traditional boxes and exploring a lot of very just speculative elements in very dark and, and dystopian ways. So I, not knowing anything, I actually started, so Han Song is the first author in the series that I did not know anything about. And I started, I went and asked advice of, of other um, individuals. As you mentioned, um, Ken Leo, uh, if I'm sorry if I mispronounced his, his name, um, but because he's so well versed in doing translations of, of Chinese fiction, and also uh, Nick Bomatos is involved. He does a, a lot with the Japanese um, fiction. He's very, very knowledgeable. And I reached out to a lot of other authors and I kind of consistently got back, you know, um, Han Song is somebody to look at. And, and I started reading online some of his work that had been previously translated, which one of them was The Wheel of Samsara. And I thought, my God, that's such just a beautiful story. So one of the important things also is to my embarrassment, I can't speak any language besides English. And although Han Song, he writes in Chinese, it, he can also speak Chinese or he can also speak English. So I could communicate with him. I didn't want to have to have a translator translate every single email message and, and context back and forth. So fortunately, Han Song could speak English. So I, I could still communicate with him during this process and then bring in a translator to actually go through the process of translating Han's work in, into the English language. And that's where I was so, so fortunate to um, bring Nathaniel Isaacson in, into the process. And Nath Nathaniel Isaacson had previously already translated some of Han Song's work. They already had a great working relationship together. So um, it was very, um, uh, serendipitous that they are all willing to to work to translate additional stories um, for this book. This primer, this volume, it took over two years of of doing a lot of kind of um, back and forth. And I purposefully, I, I don't make these books with any sort of a deadline. I don't want anyone involved to feel a rush that they have to get something done because I, the, the level of stress really isn't necessary. I want everybody to to just do their best and you know in the time frame that it needs to to be able to kind of put out that un unrushed um, project that that is the best that it can be. Well, and it's really interesting too because um, the success of the three body problem, which just no one saw coming, which uh, partially is like who knew that Barack Obama was going to tweet out that he was reading a Chinese science fiction yeah. novel. And, and that really changed the ball game for, for these Chinese translations when, you know, um, you know, that was just bizarre. But one of the things that's really interesting about Han Song um, who, and uh, Hao Zhi Fang, who like as these two very famous science fiction writers or, or that are winning awards, right? And getting national or international attention as science fiction writers, they're both well known in China for not being science fiction writers. Han Song is known as a journalist mm -hmm. um, who, you know, um, is very well known for that. And and uh, Hao Zhengfeng is known as a education reformer who is internationally famous for opening schools in rural China and goes around the world um, giving lectures on economics and education reform. But oh yeah, she wrote this 600 page science fiction novel that's very reminiscent. Uh, it's like a Chinese version of The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin. So like, you know, it's it's very fascinating that, and, and, and even um, Stanley Chan's um, uh, the Waste Tide, which is an incredible cli-fi, like cyberpunk craziness. There's really incredible things going on with Chinese science fiction. Um, and, you know, being that they're one of the most populated um, nations in the world, it's really interesting to see. Um, and also just how clever science fiction writers in China are about expressing themselves when they yeah. live in a fairly repressive regime, 
right? Yeah, and, trying to get around a lot of the, the sense. They really do have the the censorship um, issues there that we we take for granted as you know not not affecting anyone here here in America and the writing that that we read. They in China they have to. Um, be very careful about what they say and the way that they say it. And a lot of things that they do write that are incredible works, they're just completely repressed. They're, they're, no, no publication is allowed. It, it, it's shut down. It, it's taken back. So they have to find other ways to be able to share their voice and to get that message out. At, at the same time, not, ever, not all the genre writers could be really considered to be anti- establishment for uh, like Hao Jingfeng is um, like I said, she's an education reformer, so she is working to change the educational system there. But um, it would be a misreading of vagabonds to as assume that, um, for example, Mars in the book is not China and Earth is not the West. And there, th these kind of interpretations. I'm sorry, I just just read that book too, so my my brain is is very much on that. But um, Michael. Han Sung Fung or, or um, Han Sung was uh, a new writer for you. What was it like? Was this your first time reading Chinese genre fiction? Hmm. Well, I wouldn't say first time reading Chinese uh, science fiction. Uh, Han Sung was brand new author to me. I have read. I had even taught a class in uh, world literature where we sampled some, you know, classic Chinese authors and. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I mean, so some of the themes here were familiar to me, and yet it was a kind of an. I felt like I was entering a new world, reading his works. Uh, it's surrealism for the most part, as far as I'm concerned, because he'll take the setting and just weirdness abounds within it. Characters get lost in it in their worlds. Uh, they encounter weirdness around every corner or every train car, <laughs> or whatever it might be. And you, it, it, the world that these characters are in begs you to try to understand it, but it's incomprehensible. And I love that tension between wanting to know more discovery and the kind of unknowability of the universe that these microcosms that he invents um, kind of call attention to. It's really, it's really a fun to read his work. It, it becomes absorbing. Uh, you know, he writes very absorbing fiction. And so I, I fell in love with it right away. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like Bizarro, but, but with some chops to it. <laughs> yes, David. It's interesting that you should mention that because Bizarro fiction pretty much was born in China with the tales from the Chinese studios. So oh, uh, I don't know that. There you yeah, go. well, uh, short, bizarro weird fiction one of the earliest and longest in print um collections of an, a single author writing just whacked out weird stuff um I can't well, i'm really not surprised to hear that because you know if you think of anime if you think of hong kong cinema uh like especially like ghost stories set in asia i mean or coming out of asian film uh studios there's a lot of weirdness that's going on. And some of it is almost compulsory for these creators so that they can, it, it's a liberating, science fiction fantasy is a realm that's liberating for them because it's the world of the imagination. And while it's clearly, there's a lot of like allegory going on that's about the nation and Chinese uh, governance or Chinese kind of role in the world, uh, Chinese power, uh, there's always kind of this under, you know, underground critique of it. So it's really, I can see why you're into it, David. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's kind of the cool part of uh, Chinese literature. But Han well, Song is doing some amazing stuff, you know. Um, the author is uh, Pu Sung Ying Ling. And the reason I, I read um, uh, Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio, it's, it's been, the title goes back and forth depending upon who translates it, um, is... Um, my one of my favorite movies of all time is uh, Chinese Ghost Story, which was in which Chinese Ghost Story comes from this book, like the story that inspired it. And um, my first attempt at a novel, my uh, I mean, it's out of print now, but I did a, a Chinese wuxia um, vampire novel called uh, Hunting the Moon Tribe, and um, it was absolutely one hundred percent 
probably 200 percent influenced <laughs> by uh, reading that book um because i was a fan of chinese ghost story and was like and kept saying that oh these are all based on these all these elements from Chinese ghost story come from this short story collection. And so I have a very old copy of Tales from a Chinese Studio that I that has traveled around with me for, for many years. And that, that has all kinds of ghosts and fox demons. And it's, it's incredible. And it's what, 300, 400 years old, you know? Um, and uh, so, yeah, and Han Song's in that tradition, right? So, um, and that's why Chinese uh, fiction is so, I think, so surreal. Um, and because this is one of the towering achievements of Chinese literature is this collection. And it's, you know, up there with the romance of the three kingdoms. And if you're in, if you're seriously a nerd for Kung Fu movies, you've got to know Tales from a Chinese Studio and the Romance of the Three Kingdoms because there's only 150 movies based on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms um, in the history of Kung Fu movies. <laughs> uh, and, when I, and I'm not kidding, there's 150 different movies that basically <laughs> adapt one chapter or another, uh, oh. entire movies based on a chapter of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is the Lord of the Rings of Chinese literature. So... I'm sorry, I can nerd out on that stuff all day. Um, but uh, Han Song, this was, I was so excited when this uh, came in the mailbox, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and bumped it up in my reading, uh, my TBR, and knocked a bunch down. Uh, no offense to those other books. <laughs> um, like, I, I had to get it. And um, he was new to me, so I'm not that praise of saying that he's the Brian Evanson of Chinese fiction is no little thing. It's something that I, I did not make that, that statement lightly. Now, the next book, um, we're almost done here, <laughs> uh, but the next book is Ramsey Campbell. That is truly exciting. Now we're getting into to the goats, right? Into the greatest of all time. Yep, and, yep. Uh, Ramsey Campbell, I'm currently working on on volume six. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of bring it around to an, Britain, another country I, I haven't done any anything with yet for, for the great UK. And you think of a British horror legend, none other than Ramsey Campbell, and the Oxford Companion to English Literature describes him as the most respected living horror writer. He's been around um, over half a century, publishing professional writing stories that are still widely anthologized and, and read today. So part of the series is to look at authors whom we can call really masters, masters of, of, the, of the form, modern masters, and that you know our next generation can look back and say, you know, back back in those days, you know, here here are really the the kings of the the dark uh, fiction short story format and Ramsey Campbell, he, he's up there. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. Now, where where do we go from here? What are some authors like, are there dream authors that may be, you know, hard to attain that you, that you could see being a part of this if you got a hundred deep or something like that? <laughs> oh, my hundred D roll. I always say Neil Gaiman, man, I, I mean, Neil Gaiman because just for his his magic realism and it, his stories have just always been so in, personally inspirational to me, and he's also another author that he can write across the board, across so many genres. But I also look at him as as unreachable. So definitely the the triple hundred D author there is is Neil Gaiman. When I started this process, I I made a long list of of authors that I was interested in authors that I'm still interested in. And I constantly, you know, a couple of unfortunately, like some of those authors have already passed away. Um, you know, I, I go back and, and I add authors in, into there. Um, yeah, I, I have authors. I'm constantly, I, I have a lot of authors, again, authors that I've grown up with and authors that I, I widely read. I think, man, I would love to do a volume on, on this one. But I also, part of the series and part of my own process is that I, I do want to constantly kind of expand my mind out in different ways. I know I was really, I was really looking for a, a Hispanic author 
And I wanted to reach out to uh, Carlos Ruiz uh, Zafon, if I pronounced his, his name right, because he writes in magic realism and he writes in the Spanish language, yet he lives in Los Angeles, but he just passed away like two months ago. Mm. I think, ah, oh, that was another one that, I mean, for my own purposes, he, he, he's probably too big, but I, I was thinking he needs another, another loss to, to the, the, the world. Probably uh, Sylvia Moreno Garcia would be great. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she would be great too. I made a list of criteria that one of those is that I, I wanted authors to have been involved in the publishing world and, and writing professionally for at least 25 years, mm. just so that they have kind of a backdrop against the rises and falls in, in the publishing cycles. And they're kind of involved in the history and that they would be seen as this inspiration for generation after after generation of, of writing. Because yeah, there's there are so many great new authors. And I think my, my list would just run and it would run deep, def, definitely. But I, I I have been particularly looking for authors who have been involved because my own subjective opinion, and it's no knock against anybody who writes their first book is, is, is utterly brilliant. But I, I tend to think that it, for the most part, authors who are relegated as kind of the, the masters of the form are those who have been involved in the industry for a longer amount of time rather than somebody who just, they come along and they publish amazing works, but then they're gone after five years and they don't necessarily have that staying power. And, and that's just, it's just real random criteria that, that I developed, but it helps me to narrow down the, the amount of authors. Otherwise, I'm, I'd be pulling my hair out over there's just so many great authors and amazing talent out there that I, I would love to work with. Well, uh, I, I, of course, I'm going to throw my head in there with my favorite author of all time is John Shirley. And ah. I think you would be great um, as somebody just just selfishly because I want John Shirley commentary from Michael. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, the book would be great, too. But, you know, I just want the commentary. But um, all right. So at this point, um, I think we've we, we've done a pretty good job of introducing this series. I think that we've given people a lot to to to, to realize that this this is a, a a series that's like you know will look really great on your shelf. But if you want to learn the nuts and bolts of writing horror fiction and expanding your mind as a as a science fiction writer, um using these texts, not just as like entertainment, but um, getting out a highlighter and looking for the things that, um, that you can learn from. Uh, you know, I think um, anybody who reads critically uh, short fiction can, um, you know, it's a, it, it, you can learn so much about the form it's harder to learn from a novel because it's it's so long unless you're thinking about structure and you're thinking about those things. But with short story, you can really learn the nuts and bolts of writing. So I think um, the idea of these being out there in libraries and being, being, of course, is great. And for being out there in MFA programs, yes, um, that's really good. But if you're a self-taught writer who doesn't have the money to go to or can't get into an MFA program, this, these are a really great volume to use. Um, and so for a last and final statement from each of you, um, how do you think these books are best used by those self-taught writers? Oh, you, you laid it out so well. I mean, that for being a self, that's myself. I, I never went through any sort of a writing program. I'm a self-taught writer. So I think by, by my very nature, when I read a story, I read it for enjoyment, but I also read it for why does it work for me? You know, what, what, what is it that makes this story so enjoyable to read, so, so resonant, so rich? Is it the characterization, the setting, the message, or is it just all of the above and how, and how it's been wrapped together? Um, so from author to author, not only have I been, you know, I, I say that I want to have di diverse voices, and that's part of it. But more importantly, I want to have diverse styles of writing. Um, so I think across the realm, all of these stories, 
they are, I purposefully chose stories that are not, um, they're not, you don't need trigger warnings for these stories. There's no splatter punk. There's, there's nothing that is offensive. These are stories that can be enjoyed um, for, you know, ages 14 and up, I think was kind of like the age that, that I determined. But you can look at how is one subject matter treated by one author and then treated by, by a different author. You know, and a lot of it has to do with their voice. And I think the voice, then that in turn ties into the diversity of culture. But it also just, it, it, a lot of it is just the, di the diversity of, of the personality in, in the way of, st of style writing. So Steve Rasnick Tem, he writes in a very quiet, dreamy sort of writing. And that's when I read Steve Rasnick Tem, that's kind of the, the word that comes to mind is dreamy. It's just so quiet. Um, like it's just very meandering and thoughtful. And then when you read, you know, like Jeff, Jeffrey Ford, for example, he has that hard nosed literary um, sensibility to it. And it's very crisp and it's very, um, it's taking you down one direction, but then you find that you've actually been led down a, led down a different direction too. So I think that's what, what's important is to kind of, you're looking at these authors, not only by their style, but, but what, they, what they represent. And from what one author represents to the next, to the next, to the next, how any one of them have found their own ways to be successful through their own voice, but they've made their voice meaningful. And that's really the most important part is for any up and coming writer is if you wanna be a writer, not only do you have something important to say, but you have to be able to say it in, in a way that's memorable and a way that's interesting to you. The end. I would also say that I consider this, and I haven't said this in any of my reviews, but I mean, this is blurb material, buddy, Eric. All right, I'm writing, I'm writing it down. This is the Criterion Collection of short dark fiction, is what is the kind of comparison that I would give it. So it's like a it's like a Criterion Collection, I guess I would say. Love uh, that. <laughs> but that is to movies, so. Yeah, you know, I was thinking of a metaphor in, in music, actually, that these are like best of albums by solo artists, you know? It's like, you know, Lindsey Buckingham might be in Fleetwood Mac, just as Jeffrey Ford might be in a lot of anthologies. But here you get to really drill down and focus on one author, their best work, and just think about what the, the, their voice and their style really is at the foreground, I think Eric put it really uh, succinctly there. Then, you know, uh, so as a writer studying these, it's like kind of like just spending some time as a musician might listening to one guitarist for a while. You learn the craft by going deep that way mm -hmm. and so kind of sustaining your concentration on a single author or artist's work, just like you would surveying broadly. So these are like deep tracks or something. <laughs> no, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I think that that's good. Now, um, all right, your work personally, um, uh, uh, besides the series, starting with Eric, um, uh, you're an author. Uh, I read a really um, cool book, uh, a novel of yours and a short story collection, and I appreciated both. Uh, but can you tell the folks what you've got out personally as a writer? And then um, Michael, and we'll close up shop. Oh, sure. I, uh, I also, I, I run a series called the Horror Classics um, that's published through Sourcebooks along with Leslie Klinger. Um, we release these on, on a quarterly basis and or the Haunted Library of Horror Classics is the full proper title. So these particular books are novels of horror literature that are being brought back to light for wider recognition. And these are books that have been, are over a century old. And these are the writers or the books that we talk about authors who inspired us. And then these are the books that inspire those authors. So like The Beatle and uh, Vathek. Um, a lot of these older titles and we add in ancillary material, reading lists, introductions, um, discussion questions for classroom use. So I, I didn't want to take a moment to, to plug that. All of the, the profits for that go to hardship funds. 
and scholarship programs for authors. Um, and then personally, I, I also run Dark Moon Books, the, the press for the um, Primer series. And I, I publish different anthologies of works through that. And then, you know, I'm, I'm a writer, so I, I publish short stories. I'm, I'm working on what I hope will be a, a second collection that may be released in, in 2022. Uh, I've got a couple other diff different novel ideas that, that I work on. But um, yeah, that's a lot because I, I still have the day job. And then I'm also adjunct faculty teaching young kids and the distance learning. So it's a lot of balancing. Right. Uh, Michael, I know I read one of your books long ago. It was a Raw Dog Streaming Press book. And I am sorry I am missing the title it was the one with the cards uh um, oh, play dead play dead yes that yeah. was very good i just Thanks. read it a very long time ago uh, <laughs> but uh i i really did appreciate that book so uh what what works do you have out there and what what can people find yeah what, real quick i have to say play dead is amazing what raw dark screaming press did with that book because they released this limited edition sculpture bound uh version where like the hardcover binding has literally sculpture embedded on it. It's really awesome. There's only like, I, I don't think they only did 50 copies of that. I don't know, but it's really hard to find. And it's like total collector's item. And I, you know, that's like, I love that stuff. I love all kind of horror stuff, as you can tell. So like, I also write in, in various ways. So like nonfiction for this uh, series, uh, to me, it's one of the gems in kind of what I'm doing. Uh, I love t sharing this book series with people. Um, but also, like, I have a lot of little things coming out. Like, I'll have a poem in the Horror Writers Association's uh, Poetry Showcase, which I think is going to come out at the end of the year. That's probably the next thing that's going to come out. And if, you, if anyone listening to this, watching this, wants to see what that weird Arnzen guy is up to, just follow me on Twitter, at Mike Arnzen. And uh, you'll see. <laughs> uh, but right now, I'm, I'm actually working on. I'm calling it a vampire novel, but it's not your usual vampire novel. I, I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. But it's pretty weird. So that's wow. well, kind of my side project right now. I'll have to have you back when you finish that. Um, and Eric, um, you're always welcome. Of course, uh, I. Uh, love your work, um, but you didn't give us any titles, so I want you to give us some of your personal titles. So uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm terrible at uh, at doing PR. <laughs> I always like talking about other people's work, and I feel for myself. I always do kind of like shut shut down. But my my novel that I appreciate you you mentioned you you had read and uh, enjoyed uh, that is called Doorways to the Dead Eye. And it was more, it was less of horror and more of a magic realism adventure story dealing with um, transient hobos and the actual historic language that they had developed called the hobo code, which is a form of hieroglyphics. Um, and then how that kind of develops into, into alternate realities, which are ways to um, continue living through your memory. So dependent on how strong your memory is, that creates a sort of um, perseverance, but at the same time, how memories are altered. And so how memories are constantly battling for prominence over other memories. And once a memory is gone, that's kind of the equivalent of a, of a second death. I uh, are really forgotten forever. I once described your novel to one of my friends as, um, the Lee Marvin movie, Emperor of the North meets uh, Talisman. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was funny because then I had to explain what Emperor of the North was. So um, I was like, well, okay, that didn't really help with that analogy, but it's a good book and, um, and obviously very well researched. And I really appreciated that aspect of it. And yeah. um, so- A lot went into that on, on that end. So my, yeah. my collection uh, through, through Cemetery Dance, is called um that which grows wild mm -hmm. um so that that one i'm i'm probably most proud of my collection only because as i mentioned earlier i'm, I'm a huge fan of of the short form so this was you know the, these are some of my my best short stories 
um, put together for a publisher that I insanely admire. All right. Uh, thank you guys for uh, coming on the podcast and for anybody who made it this far. Um, uh, you're awesome for listening. Um, and so please uh, check out this series. Uh, I think it's great. And um, yeah, the Primer to Han song uh, is definitely, um, I mean, they're all great, but that, that, that was definitely the one. I know you're, you say Jeffrey Ford is the one people should, should buy, but Oh, I don't, I can't say I have a favorite. They, they all are meaningful to me in different ways. Like every one of them, it's like having um, multiple children. You love your children for, for different strengths and different experiences. And each one is a good memory. All right. So uh, thank you for joining Postcards from a Dying World. And uh, I hope uh, people uh, go out and check out these books.